Okay, so we're going to go ahead. Um, we're starting now. Um, the recording has started. So we'll do a round of quick, um, a round of quick introductions. And then we do have a slide deck um, that we will be showing. Um, and we're going to go over certain topics. So once I put that slide deck up with uh, the topics that we're going to cover, we do ask that you hold your questions until we've gone over the slide deck, because we'll, you'll find is that the questions that you typically have will be answered during the slide deck presentation. So if you could hold your questions until we're done with the slide deck, that'd be great. Um, once we're done with the slide deck, you can drop your questions into the Q&A forum versus the chat, please. Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, John and uh, Desiree, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourselves, please. Okay, while well, I go ahead and start, um, my name is John Hart. I'm a professor and uh, director of online programs in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois. Um, and I'm also the Executive Associate Dean of the Graduate College here at the University of Illinois. Hi, I'm Desiree Merman. I am one of the academic advisors specifically for the online MCS and CSDS program. My name is Christine Martinez. I'm the other advisor for the online MCS and CSDS program. Terrific. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop here so you can see the slides. Okay, can everybody see that? Yep, okay. So again, welcome. This is the online MCS, MCSDS admissions webinar. Um, I'm gonna move on to the first slide and the first slide is simply welcome and thank you for joining us. So the topics we're gonna to cover today are, um, goes over application requirements um, for both domestic and international students. Um, we'll go over uh, tuition and financial aid, We'll go over some FAQs, uh, we'll go over application deadlines and where you can find additional information. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, what are we looking for? Um, John, could you speak to that please? You bet. So this is the Master of Computer Science program. The Master of Computer Science program is basically eight courses designed for professional preparation in computer science. Um, there's no thesis, no research, uh, you won't be working with an advisor. It's really a capstone in computer science that focuses on uh, advanced graduate level coursework that will help you um, uh, work in the, in the profession of computer and uh, data science. So uh, it's a professional degree. Um, one of the things we're looking for is uh, it's set up to, to handle multidisciplinary uh, work. We see a lot of students with computing backgrounds that want the advanced graduate level coursework in, in computer science. We also see uh, students coming from other backgrounds um, uh, in the sciences, uh, in, in the arts, uh, in medicine, law, um, uh, psychology, sociology, the humanities. They want to add a, an MCS on top of that. And as long as they're qualified and they have the prerequisites, um, we've designed the degree to be able to handle that as well so that you can incorporate computer science or data science into a particular discipline. Um, but in order to do that, you have to have all of the uh, prerequisites needed to be admitted to the degree. So for the academic background required to uh, be admitted to the degree, first, in order to get a master's degree at the University of Illinois, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Uh, a bachelor's degree represents uh, a, a broad training uh, in, in a variety of different areas. Um, there's uh, composition and being able to, to write um, and uh, other uh, humanities and other requirements that you would have uh, for that kind of broad base. And then the master's degree is a specialization on top of that. Looks like we skipped ahead a slide, uh, Christine. So, um, uh, it's important to have a bachelor's degree. Uh, that's going to be required. Um, and then also, um, uh, that bachelor's degree doesn't need to be in computer science, and we'll, we'll show you some, some ways of uh, uh, improving your admissions uh, um, chances. Um, if, you're, if you have a bachelor's degree that's not in computer science, there are things you can put on the application form that uh, help point us towards your, uh, your prerequisites and another uh, background um, to make you uh, uh, make your application um, clearer on your qualifications for graduate work in computer science. Um, also, uh, your, grad, your GPA, uh, your grade point average, on a scale of 4.0, should be 3.2 or higher. 
And we do holistic uh, evaluations for admissions. We look at the entire package. We look at um, the situations people have studied uh, in and grit and uh, perseverance. We also look at GPA um, uh, for the entire bachelor's degree in the last two years for your computer science course. And if your GPA is lower than 3.2, uh, you can also uh, take uh, some, some uh, uh, additional courses, uh, um, you know, upper division computer science courses that'll help show us that you can uh, succeed in, in computing and we'll evaluate those as well. But our general expectations is that students would have a grade point average of 3.2 or higher. Um, in order to study um, computer science at the graduate level at, uh, at our program, which is a top five program um, worldwide, um, it's important to have the uh, fundamentals of computer science behind you. And so, um, especially data structures. And so most students come to us uh, with a knowledge of a programming language like Python, that's good. Um, it's important to understand object-oriented design and being able to program and design uh, data structures in an object-oriented fashion. It's important to understand data structures, um, uh, different uh, uh, hierarchical data structures and uh, array uh, configurations and the algorithms behind them to accelerate searching and, uh, um, and sorting and, uh, and various other um, algorithms. And to understand how those algorithms um, operate then, and to understand their um, asymptotic complexity. Um, if you're working with a large data set, uh, you may have an algorithm that works fine for 10 numbers if you have an array of 10 numbers. But for data science, you're often dealing with an array of 10 billion numbers. And the same algorithm that worked great for 10 numbers may not finish in, in your lifetime or the lifetime of the universe on an array of 10 billion numbers. And we can study that theoretically so that you know that the algorithms you're implementing are appropriate for big data applications. Um, most students know Python. Um, uh, many of our uh, projects, our programming projects, what are called machine problems in our computer science uh, department that's been around for uh, 70 years now, um, is that uh, it helps to know a production programming language like C++ or Java, something with a, a development environment that's compiled that can run efficiently. Um, so if you know Python, you may want to pick up C++ or Java. And then also some mathematical background. It's good to have a class on linear algebra um, and also some, um, uh, some prerequisite knowledge in statistics and probability. Okay, great. Um, the next slide, John is going to go over in more detail about programming ability. Oh, uh, yeah, we did that one. Yeah, this one. Oh, yep. gotcha. Yep, yep, good. Okay, so um, uh, many of our students are coming to us that, uh, with, a, uh, um, with a background that uh, is not necessarily in computing. So we have students coming to us with bachelor's degrees in, uh, in other fields. Um, but have been working in, for example, the software industry or have been, um, uh, you know, software engineers or, or uh, uh, working in other computing related uh, uh, work. And we also have uh, some students that have had their degree quite a while ago. Um, and so one of the things that we offer, if you, uh, most of our, most students come to us with a, a, a programming class, often in Python. But uh, it's also important to have a data structures class, the second class in computer science. And so data structures is a prerequisite for all of our graduate level coursework. And so it's important to, um, that students have data structures. If, you, um, if you've been programming and you're, you're quite competent in, in computing, but you don't have data structures in your uh, transcript, and we don't have a grade for that, uh, we'll need to be able to measure your uh, proficiency in data structures. So we have a uh, proficiency exam in data structures if you don't have a data structures class or its equivalent in your transcript. Um, and so that class is available, that, uh, sorry, that exam is available for applicants to take and you can report your, uh, um, your result on, on that uh, uh, for your application. Um, Passing the exam is only one part of uh, the admissions process, and so passing the exam doesn't automatically get you in, but it will help us ensure that um, when we evaluate your, uh, um, your application that, that you have proficiency in, in data structures. 
if you want to prepare for the data structures proficiency exam, we also have the advanced CS fundamental specialization, which has really skyrocketed. It's uh, uh, just under five stars. I think it's 4.9 stars. Um, and uh, it's, we're seeing thousands of students in the uh, specialization already, and we just launched it. So it's, uh, it's really taking off. Um, and that results in a uh, advanced CS fundamentals um, special, uh, specialization completion certificate from the University of Illinois. It also prepares you for this proficiency exam. And that's taught by one of our faculty members, uh, Wade um, Fagan Olmenschak Schneider. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Next slide. Okay. So, so let me start and then uh, Christine, maybe you can pick up from there. Uh, mm -hmm. What's required for your application? One is that you fill out the application and in filling out the application, there's going to be um, indications where you can, you can describe those prerequisites. We're gonna be asking for prerequisites in object-oriented programming, in algorithms, in data structures, um, linear algebra, and in probability and statistics. For those, for those uh, cases, it's, uh, it really helps your application if you can check off that you've got those prerequisites and then if you can give us the specific course, the course name and number, and when, when you took the course so that we can find it in your, tra in your transcript and then what grade you got in the course. Give us all of that information as completely as possible in the box next to that and that will, um, that will ensure that we're, we're, um, we're evaluating your application as completely as we can. It, it, it's always good to, to make that as clear as possible to make sure that nothing gets overlooked. Often these data structures classes go by other names. Um, sometimes it's a second course in computer science, but it, it needs to cover algorithmic complexity. It needs to cover sort, sorting, searching algorithms, graph algorithms, and so on. And so you're, um, institution it may for your bachelor's degree it may have gone by a different name and so it helps if you can point us to to that course and then we can verify that information so that's really important uh, another is the application fee um, every application of this program has to be processed we go through the transcripts with a fine-tooth comb we take the GPA and we measure it on all those different metrics as well as looking at where the uh, where the GPA is coming from and often those uh, GPAs are reported uh, on a different scale than, uh, than 4.0. And so um, um, there's a lot of work that goes into that. And in order to cover that work, we have to require an application fee. It's $70 for domestic students and $90 for international students. And that's university-wide. That's not just for our program. That's for anybody that applies for any graduate degree at the University of Illinois. Uh, we have that application fee. So um, uh, we won't be able to look at your application because it needs to be processed in order for us to look at it and do a proper apples to apples evaluation of that. So it's important that that application fee be paid when you submit the application so that we can look at your application. Uh, there's room for three letters of recommendation, but those are not required. Um, for a master of computer science application, we tend not to look at the letters of recommendation unless we have some question about a prerequisite or if you don't have, uh, if you're missing a prerequisite, sometimes you can use a letter of recommendation to, if somebody uh, with any kind of authority in that area can speak to your knowledge about a particular area that you weren't able to list a transcripted graded um, uh, credit uh, varying class uh, for that. Uh, then you can include a letter of recommendation to speak to that if somebody can, can provide a, 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 you know, a good evaluation of your of your efforts in that. Otherwise, uh, don't sweat the letters recommendation. They really don't, uh, don't, they won't factor in as much into your application. Um, uh, the statement of purpose, we will refer to that as well. We look at everything. We'll refer to that if we have any questions. Um, uh, same with your resume. We'll want to see what you've done, uh, any projects that you've done. That, that's always helpful. Um, and then you have to have transcripts, but they can be an unofficial uh, uh, photocopy of your transcripts, but uh, if you are admitted, then we will need your official transcripts by the first, uh, um, um, by the, uh, in, the, in your first semester of, of classes. And for the unofficial ones, uh, try to make the copy as clear and as readable as possible. 
you're shooting yourself in the foot if we can't read your transcripts. Um, uh, we, uh, so you want to make the, the transcripts uh, in a, a nice, clear, legible copy uh, to the extent possible. So be careful for that. Um, you're free to submit uh, GRE scores or any other tests. Um, they're not required. Uh, we admit students um, without them, but if you want to include them, we will look at them and we will consider them in the application. Uh, Christine, anything you want to add? Yeah, sure. So for the transcripts, um, we'll need to see the we'll need to see the grading scale for the transcripts. And typically, uh, most of the grading scales are listed on the back of the transcript. So when you're making a copy and scanning, be sure to check the back. If the grading scale is there, please be sure to upload that into your application as well. Um, and as John had mentioned, for the application, only an unofficial transcript is required. So if you, you know, you can copy and scan that in. But if you are offered admission and enrolled in the program, you will be uh, required to submit official um, transcripts. And for international students, sometimes that can take a while for them to procure those official documentation. So we just want to be, you know, make you aware that you will be required to submit that information. So just start thinking about, you know, how long it might take for you to submit that. Okay, next slide um, goes over um, requirements for international students. Uh, do you want me to go over this, John, or do you yeah, want to go over this? Good. Okay, so for international students, um, there are different minimum requirements by country. Um, you'll want to uh, click on this link or go to this link to check and see what specific requirements are required for your uh, for the country where your institution is. Um, and then also for English proficiency requirements, um, if your native language is not English, um, you would be required to submit TOEFL scores or ILET scores. Um, and for the, the univ uh, for this program, um, what we're looking for, if you're taking TOEFL scores, you want to have a score of greater than 102. Um, if you're taking IELTS, you want to have a score that's greater than seven. And either one, both of them have to be less than two years old by the proposed um, start term of study. So if you're looking at for example, um, getting into spring 2020, you'll, your IELTS score should be um, January, from January 2018, no older than that, essentially. Um, there are exceptions to the English proficiency requirements. Um, so, and we do provide exemption waivers. For instance, if you have completed a degree within five years of the proposed start term, um, and that degree was completed in a country where English was an official language spoken, you could be exempt from that TOEFL or IELTS um, requirement or if you've been employed in a country where English is the official language spoken and you've been employed there uh, within two consecutive years of the proposed start term and are currently employed, you could file for an exemption um, as well. But you'll want to check in, you know, check that link to make sure you meet those exemption requirements. Okay, next slide um, goes over tuition and financial aid. Do you want Great. Let me go ahead and start with that. Okay. So, so the program is, is very flexible and very affordable. Um, it's flexible because we're delivering the material on the Coursera platform in short little video segments and um, uh, it's designed for people that are, are working or caregivers taking care of a family, <coughs> excuse me, or anybody else that uh, uh, can't, uh, you know, quit their job, uh, move to campus, move their family to campus in order to study um, full time. So it's designed to, to work well with that, and it's also designed to be affordable. The tuition is uh, $670 per credit hour. Each of our classes is four credit hours, and there are eight classes required to get the MCS degree. It's a coursework only degree. These classes are designed uh, to be graduate level courses uh, to prepare you for advanced professional work. Um, and so there are eight classes at the graduate level um, in our computer science department at the highest level we have. And so $670 uh, for the 32 credit hours of the degree, for each of the 32 credit hours of the degree, ends up being $21,440 in tuition. So that's quite a bit cheaper than the, the $50,000 uh, that an on-campus degree would cost 
plus the the cost of living on campus and plus the you know the loss of your your annual salary if you have to leave your job in order to study full time so it ends up being a, a pretty good deal in addition to that tuition um, uh, there are some additional fees that I should mention one is um, proctoring we make sure that our um, um, all of our courses have um, comprehensive exams the ones that do have comprehensive exams uh, are proctored uh, so there's an online proctoring service it's similar to like a, um, um, a Lyft or a, a Uber where you would hire the proctor and the proctor would proctor your exam and, and would um, would find the details on how to set that up and then they um, they basically make sure that, um, that you as a student are taking the exam and not cheating and we do that out of fairness for each of our students to make sure that uh, uh, each student is being evaluated properly and nobody's getting an undue advantage for that. So that those proctoring fees are typically $40 per class for, for most classes. So it's uh, not much there. Uh, any books that you may need to purchase to, to take the class. Most of our classes are taught by um, either the, the, the professor that wrote the book that everybody's using in the case of Zhao Wei Han and data mining or um, uh, or Mike Heath in the case of uh, numerical um, uh, numerical methods, uh, numerical analysis, uh, or, um, or or the course notes uh, for the class are an extract from the book um, from the person that wrote the book. So um, uh, there's a variety of uh, um, of needs for taking the class. Sometimes you'll need to buy a book. Sometimes the uh, the equivalent of a book will be provided to you for free. I know the book that we use for data visualization, the class that I teach, uh, is freely available to any University of Illinois student. So as long as you're okay with an online version of that book, then, uh, then that book is free. Um, and then many of our, um, um, many of the examples in the class, the, the programming projects that you'll be doing, will be using a cloud computing um, platform. And so you'll be learning how to do cloud computing um, not only for our cloud computing classes, but for many of our other classes as well. And we uh, have arrangements with Microsoft Azure and Amazon Web Services that provide free credits to students, but often students want to explore further and, and will do additional work that beyond those free credits. And so you may need to purchase some cloud computing time as well. But those are, uh, you know, a, a small, um, small amount uh, on the order of hundreds of dollars. Uh, uh, compared to the total tuition. So typically a student completing the degree will have spent you know, $23,000 maybe uh, to complete the degree, which is uh, significantly more affordable than uh, any of our on-campus offerings for, for this kind of degree. Uh, in terms of financial aid, uh, the Department of Computer Science doesn't have um, assistantships like research assistantships or teaching assistantships available for online students. We've designed this program to be affordable. Um, part of that design is that we've been able to lower the tuition for everybody based on, um, uh, based on the fact that we can't waive the tuition for anybody. So, um, uh, so we've got that low tuition, um, uh, that low tuition cost, but uh, because of that, we don't have any assistantships that can be made available to any students uh, in, in the program. With that said, the program is fully accredited by the HLC, the same accrediting agency that accredits all of the programs at the University of Illinois. Um, this is a, a pro, it's an online program, but uh, you get the exact same degree as any of our students on campus uh, would get. Um, uh, it's just a, it's a Master of Computer Science at the University of Illinois. And because uh, it's a fully accredited degree, it is as eligible for uh, financial aid as any other degree at the University of Illinois. And so you can go to our financial aid office uh, online, um, or uh, you can apply through your employer or, or, um, uh, or through your, your, any local government agencies or, or other organizations um, to look for uh, scholarships or other assistance to, uh, uh, for tuition. And I know some employers, uh, for example, um, C3.ai uh, will, will provide tuition assistance for its employees uh, to take this. And so you may want to check with your employer as well um, if they have any programs like that. And uh, Christine, you want to pick up from there? 
Yeah, so with uh, third, uh, we do have, the university does offer uh, third party sponsor billing. Um, and as John was mentioning, um, C3AI, um, you know, that's an example of a company that does sponsor its um, employees. And so if you have, if you work for a company that is, is you know, willing to reimburse you for tuition or to pay your tuition directly, um, you're, you and your company would be able to work with the uh, uh, cashier's office to set that payment up. Um, the information for that is you would just go to the paymybill.illinois, um, ui.illinois, um, to get that information on how to set that up. Okay, next slide. Let's see, this one went backwards. Um, next, we jump into the FAQs. Um, so, John, I'll just read these off to you, and if you want to address them. Um, okay, so first question, that one of the first questions we always get is, what is the online MCS? That's a, that's a good question. So the online MCS, the MCS degree, the Master of Computer Science, it's a degree we've been offering for a long time. The, the um, uh, computer science is a, uh, um, it, it is a very strong program and it's been around for a long time at the birth of computing. Some of the first computers built were built on this campus with the ILIAC series of uh, of computers. And uh, the Master of Computer Science is one of our master's degree. We have a Master of Science and we have a Master of Computer Science. A Master of Science degree uh, requires a thesis and you would work with an advisor and, and write a thesis that you would have to defend uh, and that would be part of your degree requirements. And typically we see students that want to do research in computer science uh, write a thesis and do a Master's of Science degree. We don't have an online version of the Master of Science degree. Uh, the Master of Computer Science is, is designed for professional preparation and does not require a thesis. You don't work with an advisor on writing a document. Um, uh, what, what you do do is you take um, all 32 credit hours um, as coursework, and that coursework is at the graduate level um, in order to better prepare you for, um, for work as a professional in computer science or in data science. So that's the Master of Computer Science. It's basically eight courses. And then we offer that online. We've offered this degree online since the 90s. And we've been offering uh, online education since the 60s. We invented a good part of online education um, with the Plato system long before there was an internet. Um, I should also mention, you know, the browser came out of the uh, University of Illinois with uh, uh, the original Netscape browser. Um, so uh, there's been a long history of those developments and we use that technology very early to offer degrees online. Um, this online degree is offered in partnership with Coursera because based on student feedback we found that it was more effective to deliver the lectures of our courses as video lessons on the Coursera platform than in our previous approaches for delivering online content. And so, so we've been partnering with Coursera for that. Uh, one other thing to mention about the online MCS, the result is, uh, um, is the same degree whether you earn it online or on campus. We have a campus MCS as well, but uh, that campus MCS, we can only uh, admit maybe 50 students a year. It's a, we have very limited seating for that based on our classroom sizes and, and what, what capabilities we have on campus. Uh, for our online program, we can admit and, and better meet the needs of, um, of those looking for a Master of Computer Science degree. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, what is the MCSDS? Okay. So the MCSDS is the Master of Computer Science in Data Science. Um, it's the same MCS degree, but it's a selection of courses that satisfy the MCS degree, but do so focusing on data science. And so if you get an MCSDS, you're establishing yourself not only as a professional in computer science, but also a professional in data science. And, um, and we do that through selecting courses that satisfy, for example, the four core areas required for the MCS degree. The MCS degree has this breadth requirement that requires four different courses in four different uh, core areas of computer science. And we have nine different core areas of computer science. Things like um, uh, scientific computing is one core area. Uh, um, software engineering and formal methods is another core area. 
Um, but some of these core areas, uh, four of them in fact, we've selected for the MCSDS because they also uh, emphasize data sciences. Um, those four core areas are machine learning in the AI breadth area, um, data mining in the uh, data and information systems area, data visualization in the interactive computing area, and cloud computing in the systems and networking area. And so we've got a curriculum of those four areas um, that uh, if you take coursework in those four areas, you're satisfying your Master of Computer Science degree requirements, but you're doing so in a way that you can show your future employer that you have expertise in the data sciences. So there's nothing on the transcript that will show MCSDS. It'll just be a Master of Computer Science. But what students do is list MCSDS on LinkedIn, on your resume, and employers know what that means. And that will help establish your credentials in data science if that's the area of computer science you want to focus on. Okay. You already kind of answered the third question, which is what will appear on the diploma or transcript. Same so we'll thing move that on appears for our on-campus student. Yep. That's right. Uh, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, how is an online MCS course offered using Coursera, the Coursera MOOC platform? Good, good. Um, so we use the Coursera MOOC platform. Uh, Coursera revolutionized learning, um, online learning with this um, MOOC platform. MOOC is a uh, massive open online course, massively open online course. Um, and uh, there's two elements there. One is uh, video lessons. So instead of sitting through an hour's worth or hour and a half um, or even longer of a recording of a classroom lecture to a bunch of other students that aren't you, um, the video lessons on the Coursera platform are organized into little five to 15 minute segments. And those segments are, are intended directly for the online learner. And so those, uh, those video lessons, uh, research has shown that they're more effective at learning. Um, you learn more by watching uh, the topics and learning from the topics from these, uh, these shorter video segments than you do from a long lecture. And then you string together a bunch of these video lessons and we can cover the same amount of material we cover in a, in a uh, video lecture. What we find is that we can do this more efficiently for the, for the student as well. Um, often 10 minutes of video lesson can cover as much as an hour of what we would have covered in the lecture. Um, and and that, uh, uh, that varies based on the topic, but you can usually learn a lot more, a lot more quickly through these video lessons than you can with, from a lecture recording. So um, that's half of it. Um, the other half are these assessments and we have scalable assessments that we've developed for MOOCs. Uh, my data visualization course has already reached 365,000 learners worldwide in, in the past three years. And, um, and, and all of those thousands of learners are, are learning things not only through the video lessons, but through scalable assessments, things like quizzes and auto graded assignments and sometimes peer graded assignments. And so we, we leverage that to be able to grow our program to meet the demand that we've got for the Master of Computer Science degree. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we have to add more uh, in order to give uh, university credit, transcriptable credit for one of these courses, we have to deliver more than what's available to the general public through our Coursera MOOC. So the, the video lessons and some of the classroom exercises are available from the Coursera MOOC but on top of that, we have comprehensive uh, examinations, we have machine problems, we have uh, course projects, and we provide you with office hours so the instructor and the TAs, the many TAs we've allocated to each class can help you get through that uh, more difficult material. And so through those additional assessments and the, the video lessons and the classroom exercises, that combination meets all the requirements for our courses that we offer on campus and allows us to offer them online through the Coursera platform. Okay, so next question. Um, how are the online MCS courses different than the typical Coursera MOOC? Right, there's this additional material. Um, you have uh, the comprehensive examination, um, semester long projects, uh, machine problems, staff graded assignments, and also the uh, office hours with the instructor and TAs to help you get through all of that. Those are things that we can't offer to the general public 
those are things that we don't have the resources we need in order to do that um, are, are, are uh, supported by tuition. Those are things that we um, uh, that we have to focus on only the students that are qualified to take a graduate level course from a top five department like the University of Illinois Department of Computer Science. And so those are only available to students in the program. Um, and those are required in order for us to give university credit. Our online courses have to meet the, the requirements, uh, the same requirements as our on-campus courses. And so we need that additional material that's just not available to the general public through the MOOCs. Okay. Do the two Coursera MOOC courses and four credit portion need to be taken concurrently? It's best if they are. So um, if you take one of our classes uh, as, a, as a University of Illinois enrolled student, uh, uh, if you're admitted to the MCS program, then it's best to learn uh, everything um, the way it was intended to be delivered. So watching video lessons and doing the classroom exercises through a, um, it will basically take two of the, gen two of the general public MOOCs and we'll have a version of those that uh, where we've compiled everything together and made it, make it available only to the uh, enrolled students. And then you'll also have the classroom uh, exercises as well as the, uh, the examinations and the projects and programming um, uh, projects and everything else all in one package. That's the best way to learn. Um, the video lessons and the classroom exercises are also the same ones that are available to the general public from the MOOCs that are used for the courses. For example, our, our course on cloud computing concepts is available to the general public. You can watch the same video lessons in Cloud Computing Concepts 1 and Cloud Computing Concepts 2 on the, on the, um, uh, on the Coursera platform as MOOCs. Um, but you're missing out on the projects, the big programming projects, the staff graded assignments, the things that are required for the in-depth knowledge to get uh, uh, university credit for those. If you do complete the general public Coursera uh, MOOC versions first, it's similar to um, uh, you know just taking the general public uh, MOOC version of a course is similar to sitting in on one of our classes. Sometimes our campus students will sit in on a class and, and basically show up for class to learn the material, but won't do any of the exams or any of the homework or anything like that. They don't get a grade for the class, but they can still learn the material from the lectures and from the uh, classroom exercises. The same is true for a Coursera MOOC. You can take the Coursera MOOCs uh, before you take the class, before you're admitted as a student, and you've kind of learned the material, um, but in, in a, in not the depth that's necessary for us to give uh, uh, credit for. So any of the classroom exercises you will have taken um, from the class um, as a general, um, general public open uh, MOOC, um, that, that will be retained and can be uh, used um, towards your progress um, for the four credit class so long as the material hasn't changed and so long as the instructor allows it but for most of our classes that is allowed so you don't have to redo any of your classroom exercises but you would have to still do all of the additional um, uh, projects and, and other graded uh, uh, pieces in, in order to get credit for the class. Okay. So I think you already kind of answered the next question, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. if you complete a Coursera specialization like the cloud computing specialization or the data mining specialization, what you've done is uh, effectively sat in on classes that we would have on data mining and cloud computing, but you've not earned any credit um, and uh, uh, there's nothing on your transcript to show that. Um, so any of the classroom exercises you've done for that could be used uh, when you later take the class for credit, but otherwise um, you would have to still take the class for credit for it to count towards your Master of Computer Science degree. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, so next one is, are students expected to be proficient in particular programming languages? Um, so not necessarily. Most students know Python. We, it's good to have some experience writing uh, programs in a compiled language um, uh, like C++ or, or Java, you know, the kind of language that would be used for production software engineering. Um, so we don't really expect uh, students to know any particular language. We do expect students to be able to pick up a language. Um, as a, you know, a student in a graduate uh, uh, program, um, uh, students tend to pick up the right language, the right tool for the job. 
And so, you know, the class may be using a different language than you've used before, and that's a great opportunity for you to learn a language. Once you know one language like Python, it's, it's usually pretty easy to pick up other languages. There aren't that many differences between them. There's always nuances and so on. But you should be able to pick up a different language and be able to learn a new tool if that tool gets the job done better. Okay. Um, how do students apply for the online MCS or MCSDS? Uh, do you want to take that one, Christine? Sure. So the application link is posted to our program website. Um, you can access it there, and it is also posted to Coursera for the program website on Coursera. Um, you simply fill out the application, um, submit the fee as discussed previously, um, and then it will be reviewed if submitted and paid for on time. Uh, next question. What is my undergraduate G What if my undergraduate GPA is less than a 3.0? So um, that's a good question. If your undergraduate GPA is less than a 3.0, um, we'll look at your computer science scores. If, if you don't have computer science coursework, or if your computer science coursework is, um, has some grades that are, that are you know, under 3.0 on average, um, then it, uh, the best thing you can do to improve your chances are to take a few classes, uh, you know, at a local community college or, uh, or you know, uh, through any number of means um, that can be transcripted. And so if you take upper division computer science classes that are transcripted and you do well on that, then we will consider that. And that can usually help in cases where your GPA is, is less than a 3.0. But otherwise, uh, you know, if your GPA is less than a 3.0, it's going to fall below our, uh, um, what we need to have for students in, in our program. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we make this opportunity available to everybody that we can, but also it's important that uh, when we admit a student that that's, you know, the expectation is that a student would succeed. And uh, all of our students uh, have that expectation. Students uh, succeed in their program. Uh, the online students succeed as well as the on-campus students succeed in, in the program. And we've got, you know, 90-something you know, percent uh, success rate. Uh, which is actually quite good for a program this rigorous, both on campus and online. Um, but in order to do that, one of the things we do is we're very careful about admissions and we want to make sure that we only admit students that, uh, that can succeed. We don't want to set anybody up uh, to give them a chance, you know, uh, a very minuscule chance at succeeding. Um, that's not fair to, to the student. We don't, you know, we want to make sure that their uh, the tuition is a is a good investment in this in, in their future, and so we want to make sure that students uh, admitted to the program have that reasonable chance for success. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, which I can take actually, yeah. but the question is, do international students in this, uh, these programs receive an I-20? So the online MCS, MCSDS is 100% online. Um, so students are not required to visit campus at any time to meet the degree requirements. Um, therefore, uh, visas are not uh, granted or sponsored. Um, with that said, you are welcome to visit if you want to, as you would be part of the university the um, community. So students are welcome to visit campus. Um, they're certainly welcome to join commencement ceremonies when they graduate. Um, but again, um, visas are not granted. So I-20s um, would not be uh, granted to, to incoming students. Uh, next question. Will non-degree graduate students be able to take online MCS courses? Yeah, and the answer there is yes. Um, uh, but the um, admissions requirements for non-degree uh, MCS courses are the same as for the MCS program. Um, part of our admissions requirements are to make sure that uh, when you're a student in the MCS program, your peer students are, um, are at a commensurate level. Um, we can't, uh, you know, if we were open, if we were to open this up to non-degree students that, that weren't at that same level, then that, you know, their questions could dominate the, uh, the resources for the class. So part of this is to make sure that uh, when you're admitted, you're among a pure cohort uh, that's at the same level um, to make sure that you've got uh, adequate support uh, to get through the course as well everybody else. Okay, and then next question we've already kind of answered, um, but we can go over it again. Is financial aid available for online MCS students? So it's a fully accredited degree. You're welcome to apply for financial aid. 
um, uh, things like um, assistantships, like a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship um, that are uh, sometimes available for programs that would provide a tuition waiver. Those are not available to online students in this program. We've designed this program to provide a base uh, tuition rate that's quite affordable and quite a bit less than our on-campus tuition rate. But in doing so, uh, we have to depend on tuition in order to be able to offer the program. Okay. And then the final question is, when will applications for the next admission cycle open? So generally, they open as soon as the previous um, application closes. Uh, the next slide actually will show when the application deadlines are. So we have entries in the fall, spring, and summer, and then the corresponding application deadline. So for fall, um, the application deadline is May 30th. The decision deadline is July 15th. Um, in the spring, the application deadline is October 15th, which is coming um, right around the corner. And then the decision deadline is November 30th. For summer admission, the application deadline is February 15th, and then the decision deadline is March 31st. Um, you can always find the application deadlines at this link here. And then we have one final slide. Did you have uh, anything to yeah, add to that? Let me, let me just mention the decision deadlines. We, we try to get uh, back to everybody on that decision deadline. There's always a few cases where we're fighting to try to get the student into the program and we need to spend a little bit extra time and so if you haven't heard back by that decision deadline, often it's because um, we're, we're doing everything we can to try to get that, uh, you know, those, those, uh, those, uh, those last, uh, last students in. But some of those decisions uh, uh, require additional discussion and additional investigation. And so uh, it gives, we need a little bit extra time to, to make those final decisions. So um, it, it's easy for us to say no uh, by that deadline, but we're, we're trying to say yes to as many students as we possibly can. So okay. just give you a heads up on that. Okay, great. Okay, so we're at the final slide, and this is where to find information. Um, so I've provided the link for the application, the links to the program websites, um, the links for the requirements by country, uh, where you can find TOEFL ILS waiver information, uh, where the application deadlines can be found. And then if you have additional questions that we're not able to answer at this time, please email us at ncs at cs.illinois.edu. So that concludes our slide deck. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and then we'll just go over some of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A forum. Okay. I always start at the end. At the end, okay. Yeah. Let's do a live phone, last in, first out. Okay, all right. Last in, if I have a Coursera certificate for a subject, do I get credit for that? Um, uh, you certainly get a certificate for completing <laughs> that, but the um, uh, classroom assignments can be used uh, for the classroom assignments in, in a four credit course, but you won't get university credit for that and it won't count towards the Master of Computer Science degree. Okay, uh, Karen asks, will you send these links? Yes, so the re this session is recorded and so you will get a link of this recording and I do believe that we do share out this PowerPoint as well. Okay, uh, what is the acceptance rate of this program? 30%. Okay. Which is also the acceptance rate, the average acceptance rate for all of our campus programs. If I finish a specialization on Coursera related to this program, can I use this for my MCSDS application? Absolutely. Um, you should include that information for the MCS, but uh, just completing kind of the sitting in process of taking a MOOC doesn't necessarily tell us um, how you will do for the more rigorous uh, assignments for a four credit uh, version of that course. So often things like transcripts from a community college will be more informative than, than just completing a specialization. Okay. Um, are the faculty for the online MCS the same as on campus? Yes, they are. Very same. Okay. In fact, Zhao Wei An just received the Aiken chair. Um, it's a university-wide chair. One of the top professors on campus wrote the book that everybody uses on data mining, teaches the on-campus course on data mining all the students want to take, and also teaches the uh, um, online version of that course, too. Okay. Um, Manish asks, would I be eligible for a PhD after completing this degree? Yeah, you can apply for the PhD with just a bachelor's degree. You don't need a master's degree to apply for a PhD. 
if you um, typically for a PhD, you'd be working with an advisor and writing a thesis. And so a master's of science degree is usually better preparation for a PhD than an MCS. The MCS degree is usually designed for people that uh, uh, want to uh, improve their uh, uh, the prospects as a, as a computer science or data science professional. Usually leaders in the field, CEOs, CTOs, CIOs, uh, uh, the people that are leading industry in computer science. Uh, Tom Siebel, for example, would be the kind of person we would look at for an MCS. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me find a question here. Um, let's see, can you please share a list of courses offered online currently and which new courses are you planning to add in the coming years? Desiree, could you post a list of available courses to the chat? Yeah. Um, and then which you courses are we? Our web page? Yes. Um, John, do, which new courses are we planning to add? Uh, we have new courses coming out this spring in uh, computational photography which is machine learning um, applied to images um, to be able to see what's in an image and not just uh, reproduce the pixels. Uh, we have a new course in, in um, the Internet of Things, um, which is a uh, computer networking course that focuses where you build things with an Arduino and, uh, and a Raspberry Pi and, and a few other components. And then we have a course in computer graphics that will be launching this spring as well, in addition to the courses we already have online. Okay. Great. Next question. Um, one of my friends is from Iran. Can an Iranian student apply for the online MCS? I didn't yes. see an Iran option when I was selecting for country to register. Uh, I believe Iran, we have many students that come to us from Iran. Um, uh, there are certain export restrictions that we have to be careful of, but uh, we are instrumented to be able to handle students from Iran just fine. Uh, okay. We have uh, uh, we have a wide array of uh, specialists uh, for international applications that can help uh, with the nuances of that process. Okay. We're, here to we're here to educate the world, the entire world, and we do not factor in nationality into any of our decisions for admissions. So uh, if your admission, if you, you know, if your application comes from Iran, you've got the exact same chances of being admitted as any place else. Okay. Uh, next question is a good question. What is a typical time commitment per week per course? Is timing of courses self-paced? Yes. Um, so uh, yes and yes. Uh, the um, courses will take uh, about 12 hours a week, 10 to 12 hours a week. So if you're working a full-time job at 40 hours, that'll be an additional 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours. So 50 to 52 hours a week. Um, if you have two courses, that could be 24 hours. A full-time student would be taking three courses. That'd be like 36 hours. That's like a full-time job. So most of our students take one course, maybe two courses, but typically one course uh, at, at a time. And you can finish the degree in, in a little over two years that way. Uh, what was the second part of that question? Oh, mm, I forgot. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. Maybe re-ask the question if, uh, if I didn't answer the second half of that question. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'm moving on to the next question really quick. Are lectures live or recorded? Uh, the lectures are recorded. Office hours are live. Um, and you have an hour a week with the instructor available for office hours, but the lectures themselves are recorded and highly produced uh, so that you can cover the material uh, efficiently for your limited time that you might have available to learn the material. Okay. The other part of that first question was, is it self-paced? Oh, yes. So uh, because the lectures are uh, recorded, um, all of the material for the course, except for the, the comprehensive exams, is available from day one. So you can work arbitrarily far ahead, especially if you know you've got an upcoming uh, business trip or you've got a family vacation or something. You can work ahead to make sure you've got all that material done so you can spend time with your family or, or with work or whatever you might have. Okay. Um, is this a semester pr format program or trimester? Uh, it's a semester program and there's three semesters in a year. <laughs> so um, on campus, most of our courses are offered only in fall and spring. Here are, we have courses offered fall, spring, and summer. And our summer courses are on a compressed time scale so that the same class in the summer might require a few more hours a week because it's offered for a few fewer weeks of the year instead of the 15 weeks that our fall or spring semester is offered. Okay. 
Uh, okay, this is a good question. If my bachelor's degree is from 20 plus years ago, will that time gap negatively impact my chances at being accepted? It's one of the things we take into account, but if you know CS fundamentals, those fundamentals really haven't changed in the past 20 years. Um, it's always good to um, you know, list on your resume, your statement of purpose, and your transcripts, any, any uh, more recent coursework you've done or other work that you've done that keeps you current in, in computer science. Okay, here's a question about transcripts. Should transcripts be translated in English even though the grading system part is in English as an ECTS grading system? So transcripts should be submitted in English and native language. Um, and that is what is required, uh, both during the application and if admitted, you'll need to submit both. Yep. Same uh, question here about being accepted into the program to monitor the course. The best way to monitor the course is just look at it on the Coursera platform. Um, that gives you access to the lectures. Uh, you won't be able to see the, the, the more difficult problems that students are doing. But it's a great way to take a look at the course. Okay, and then is there any maximum years required to complete all degree courses to earn the degree? Uh, yeah, five. Okay. What kind of candidate should select MCS rather than MCSDS? Oh, okay. Uh, if you want to go into software engineering, then you might want to get an MCS instead of the MCS, MCSDS. If you want to go into um, parallel programming, uh, computational science, we're using computing for engineering applications. Um, you can still take the same, some of the same courses uh, for data sciences. You can still take data curation, uh, data cleaning. You can still take data mining, uh, but you don't have to fill in all of those gaps in those four core areas for the data science uh, curriculum that you set up. Um, everybody gets the same MCS, and it's up to you to focus that MCS on what will be most useful for you. Okay, and then one final question. If I apply for spring 2020 and do not get admitted, can I apply for summer 2020 or fall 2020? Yes, yes. Uh, I've often said the P in PhD is for persistence. Uh, <laughs> it's also, that persistence is also helpful for master's students. That's grit, that we're always looking for grit, for perseverance. Um, but also, we, it's, it's important if you get rejected from the program one semester and you send the exact same uh, application, chances are you'll get, you know, you won't be admitted for the next one as well. But we, uh, to the extent we can, and we don't have very many opportunities to, we try to provide some feedback. Um, take a look at the uh, admissions material. If you don't get in one semester, uh, try to uh, improve your chances uh, with additional uh, background or computer science coursework or anything else you can do to improve your chances. Because um, we're not flipping a coin, we're making very careful decisions. And if we get the same application two semesters in a row, you're probably going to get the same result two semesters in a row. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are still a lot of um, open questions out there. Again, um, if we were not able to get to your questions, send us an email to mcs.cs.illinois.edu and we'll get your questions answered there. Um, this concludes this session. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, you will receive a recording link of this session um, and then as well as the PowerPoint, um, I will double check on that though, just to be sure. Um, thank you, John and Desiree. Thank you, Christine, that was very good. Okay. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.